so I will do three, uh, three sections. Part one is going to be on the, uh, the background of visibility. This part two is going to be on the causes. And that's, I think this is mostly the, the one that I want to make sure people grasp uh, uh, and, you know, and have the, the concepts. Uh, and then some, I would call it some therapeutic proposals, so like uh, how do we curb and how do we mend uh, irreversibility issues in uh, neuroscience or neuroimaging. Uh, so some background, some short introduction, general remarks. Um, I think the whole uh, repulsivity crisis, as they, uh, it's called, uh, started uh, fairly long, long time ago now, like uh, uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, when uh, a little farmer uh, started to try to replicate uh, uh, experiments from um, 53 papers. So the little farmer is called Amgen. And those 50, 53 papers uh, uh, in the clinical, preclinical cancer research. And those, so those uh, were, you know, papers that were selected uh, to describe new and uh, very high, uh, and new, new results in very high impact profile journal. So uh, I think uh, typically they selected uh, cell, uh, natural neuroscience, and, uh, and uh, some, uh, some of, uh, some very, of, uh, I can't remember the third one, but those two at least. And so only very uh, high impact and very important papers uh, were selected. And they wanted to just uh, see what uh, they could do with the results uh, being published in those, in those journals. And they uh, work for a couple of years because uh, some of those uh, you know, uh, experiments were taking time. And uh, so they worked a couple of years to take all those 53 uh, results and uh, try to replicate them. At the end of the, uh, so first of all, when they didn't manage to replicate those things, they went back to the authors, they asked them for advice. When they, this didn't um, pan out and they were still stuck, um, they actually asked the people to come in their lab and uh, help them doing the experiment uh, and so on. Um, and uh, at the end of a, a few years, they uh, were able to actually fully replicate uh, six of the 53 uh, papers, free results. And that was, that was kind of like a sort of, a, uh, and I think uh, to be fair, they replicate partly uh, something like 20% uh, of, uh, of, of the 53. So like uh, th there was another uh, uh, 10 papers and, and 10 results that were kind of like a sort of a half replicated or some, some steps were replicated, but not uh, all of it. And it was a kind of a wake up call uh, for that specific community in a preclinical uh, pre cancer research. Uh, and, uh, and that wake up call uh, sort of like uh, triggered a lot of uh, down, uh, downhill uh, effects, which are, are important. Uh, but, you know, just remember that, you know, this, this, this is uh, something that, you know, uh, 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 an actual company doing, wanting to actually use the stuff uh, uh, got stuck because they couldn't uh, use the uh, uh, replicate results of, the, of, of those important papers. Important, I put it in a quote because obviously, if you can't replicate the result, uh, is the paper important? That's a question. Um, this is just another example, uh, more in our field. JB, I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but are you switching slides right now? Yes. Okay, we can only see um, your first slide still. Oh, I see. Uh, oh, actually, okay. actually, I don't see. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Now, now we can, yeah. Oh, okay, so it it's uh, so, so, all right. Okay, so sorry about that, guys. Um, uh, it seems that I can't put uh, in presentation mode. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so the, this is the slide I was talking about, uh, and this is uh, describing the Begley and Ellis uh, Nature 2012 uh, uh, little uh, paper. The problem. Okay. So this is another example uh, in uh, uh, Java Psychiatry, uh, more recent. Uh, and this is looking at all the papers that were uh, studying the unipolar unip depression uh, in, um, and, uh, and looking at a meta-analysis of the, all the results uh, of uh, unipolar depression in uh, neuroimaging studies. Uh, so they looked at uh, uh, almost 100 individual neuroimaging experiments. Uh, so 57 studies with uh, all those experiments. Uh, so 1,000 uh, patients included, or, uh, and so on, and so on. And what they found is that uh, although uh, all those individual uh, result papers uh, were re reporting something, uh, they, uh, their meta-analysis revealed no significant results across all those uh, uh, papers. 
And that was also never a little wake up call because uh, all those papers, all those studies have actually been published because some results were found and, uh, and, and claimed to be uh, statistically significant and all those things. Uh, nevertheless, and, and possibly were, like I'm not, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, but nevertheless, if you look across all those studies, uh, you would find that there is uh, very little evidence for any um, uh, positive or, or negative uh, uh, aspect of the uh, impact of uh, 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 memory or, or processes on, the, uh, on, on, those, um, on those images. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it was also like uh, something that uh, uh, people thought, okay, that's what, what's going on here. In a, in a 2000, like in an old paper, like uh, it's the same sort of thing was happening in other fields, like in the, uh, in the uh, uh, image and genetic field, for instance, uh, there's a, a very large court uh, been uh, taken by uh, uh, Jason uh, Stein and others to look at the, uh, the association of the hippocampal volume uh, with, uh, with some of the SNPs, the single nucleotide polyformisms. Um, and what they say, they looked at, uh, you know, like 10,000 uh, participants for one, uh, for one uh, study and then, and then have a replication cohort of uh, 7,000 uh, subjects as well, uh, participants. And, and what they, when they say in, in the paper is they, uh, that previously identified uh, candidate polyformisms uh, associated with hypercapital volume in general showed little association with our meta-analysis. So again, um, that's one of the, uh, the, the case where, uh, you know, they, there was a lot of papers uh, showing some uh, results and uh, those results were not uh, found in uh, when the, uh, the very large cohort was, uh, was, uh, was used. Um, and then I age thought, you know, like it, it came, it, it became so uh, prominent that, you know, like uh, people were thinking, okay, you know, uh, granting agencies were thinking, what is going on and, and, uh, and, you know, and NIH, and we must do better in that respect. And so there's uh, the, the funding agency, the, uh, the NIH funding agency started to uh, uh, plan for, you know, how do we announce a uh, disability? Uh, and this is uh, their uh, editorial in, uh, in nature in, uh, in, uh, in 2014. So the problem is really widespread. And one of the key uh, and, and most interesting papers I think uh, uh, I would really recommend you to read is the uh, why must research publish, uh, why must published research findings are false uh, by uh, uh, and this, uh, and, and, but you know, there are many other papers and many other uh, uh, venues uh, describing the problem and, 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 and trying to find why, uh, why are all so, so many results are not reproducible and so on. Um, there's a, it's, it's a very uh, interesting, uh, just looking at all those things can make you a little bit uh, uh, despondent of, uh, you know, uh, why is this, is this happening? I think I would, I would like to have a little bit of word of caution as well. There are many, many good results <laughs> that are uh, out there and, and they are very solid and are re replicated and are, uh, so it's just a matter of like, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, it's, and, and also, I would also like to say that most of those um, uh, non-replicable results uh, and are not, you know, they're not fraud. They're just like, a, you know, uh, scientists doing their best to see what, if there's something and, and probably uh, favoring sensitivity rather than specificity aspect. Uh, but but they're, not, they're not fraud. I mean, uh, I, I mean fraud exists, but it's not the point. Uh, the point is that even in our current way of doing things, uh, we end up, up with uh, uh, too few uh, solid results in the literature. Uh, JB, we had a question, um, but could, could you explain uh, what is a meta-analysis? Sure. A meta-analysis is when uh, you have, uh, let's say, 10 papers looking at the, uh, uh, I would say, association, for instance, of a memory score and the, uh, the size of your hippocampus. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, and one, one, one paper will show, okay, there's a small result, positive result, maybe one paper will show, okay, I, I, we didn't find anything. Although that's a problem because uh, uh, the and another paper also show very strong results. So, so meta analysis is when you look at all those results across uh, papers, across studies, across experiments, and you try to find okay overall uh, what is the conclusion uh, across those uh, all those experiments. So. Um, 
so this is uh, this is a problem that uh, you know started to uh, uh, bother many people. So let's uh, go first uh, uh, with the, some a quick definition, uh, because you find in the literature uh, the word reproducibility, replicability, generalizability, and all those things. Uh, so this is a classic uh, classic uh, sort of definition where uh, reproducible is for uh, is taken, and that's usually what people will mean in the literature. Be careful; uh, it's not always the case. Um, that uh, you know you can uh, take the same code, the same analysis, and uh, the same data, and that uh, and then you can reproduce your your uh, uh, your your results. It's uh, not, I mean I take uh, the word reproducibility like in more general sense. So like uh, so when I say reproducibility, it also encompasses the other things. Um, so uh, they uh, replicability, for instance, uh, would say that okay, take the same code and analysis, uh, but try to replicate on another data set. And that's uh, often what people mean by that. Um, robustness is uh, when you take the same data, but you look at different uh, code and different analysis and you find the same results. And I think the most interesting and the most uh, important concept is generalizability, really. When you look at uh, you know, different settings uh, and different uh, uh, analysis, different data, and see whether you find, uh, again, the same uh, similar uh, conclusion. So uh, I, I would really uh, start to recommend that we think always in terms of generalizability. And the question is, on what are we generalizing? So if we change the data, if we change the, uh, uh, the cohort, uh, we're generalizing on one new cohort and one new set of, of participants. Uh, is it a very strong generalization? It's just like a, just, just one of us, one of us, it's, 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 you know, it's important, but uh, you know, is, is, it, is it enough? Not always, not in all cases. You may want to say, hey, I want to generalize in, like a, in, a, in a larger setting. I want to make sure that that's, that result holds for another kind of population and so on. So, uh, so I think, uh, or, or if you want to make sure that, you know, if you're uh, using another scanner, you'll find another result. You're generalizing, you want to generalize on another uh, on the set of scanners, maybe. Uh, or if you want to uh, make sure that you know your your type of result holds uh, uh, with time, then you're generalizing with like a, the longitudinal aspect, or and and so on and so on. So so really, it's about thinking on what uh, what is going to be generalizable and on what is my claim? Is my claim on that specific data set and that specific method, or, or is my claim larger than that? And if it is larger than that. Uh, what on what aspect is it uh, larger than that? And I think that's the clarity on those things uh, is still lacking in uh, in many of the uh, uh, in most of the literature. Um, so let's go and see why we have uh, we seem to have like uh, so much problem in, uh, in 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 replicating results. And again, it's not a general thing. I, I really want to make sure that you know you're not. You know, getting out of the, uh, the the lecture being you know fully despondent. That's not the problem. Like, there's a lot of good stuff, and uh, I'm sure the thing you'll be working on will be good. <laughs> but uh, but it is important to have that in mind. That as scientists, our goal is really to uh, make sure that you know what we're producing is is solid, is is, uh, is strong, and uh, and you'll see that you know it's not that easy as uh, to do so. Um, so what is what are the cause of the uh, the potential problem? Uh, can people see properly the slides because I'm not using the, uh, yeah? Yeah, okay. looks good to me. So I've divided things into three causes and some other researchers would divide things differently. Like uh, for instance, uh, uh, so I've divided into the uh, uh, statistical problems, uh, issues with data and software, uh, and, and the more broad and uh, cultural issue of, uh, of uh, publication practices and research incentives. Uh, and, and this is just one possible division, but I think uh, at least to, in my mind, it clarifies things uh, a little bit, and I hope it will as well for you. Uh, there's, uh, there are things that are, are not there. For instance, uh, I could have put something like a, a paradigm aspect. Uh, you know, how do, is, the, is a paradigm uh, solid enough? And, uh, but I've put that a little bit back in the, uh, the statistical procedures. Uh, uh, test with test and all those things, but uh, you know, like it's just one division. What, what I want to say is just one division. If uh, you you may find some other uh, kind of division that they are uh, perfectly valid as well. That's just the way uh, I I think I think of it. Okay, so poor statistical procedures. So I mean, the first thing I will do, uh, and that will uh, you know hopefully make a bit of uh, some interactivity aspect in um, in, in this class, 
is I will try to uh, do a little poll on Slack uh, and uh, hopefully that experiment will work. Uh, and that's, uh, that poll and that question that I will ask you to, uh, to answer is really um, uh, for those who have not studied statistics uh, as a, you know, a sort of a, uh, for a, like a, uh, as I, they are not statisticians or you haven't seen it before. Please, if you have seen that question and that poll before, uh, just don't answer, don't, uh, because I want to, ha to have the real feeling of, you know, what, uh, what, is the, uh, uh, what, is, what is out there and not being biased by the, those who have uh, uh, seen it. So I will uh, uh, try, if you have seen it exactly, like uh, don't, um, you know, don't, don't, answer, don't answer it. Uh, so I will go on Slack and uh, I will try to put in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the general uh, in the general channel. Uh, I will put a little poll and hopefully this will work. Um, can everyone? Sorry. Okay, so that doesn't seem to be. Uh, oh, I see. Sorry, a little. I, I did try to make that work, but uh, uh, so let's uh, bear with me for seconds. Uh, I'm uh, mending my uh, little poll. Uh, and. Uh, and you will uh, you will be able to uh, answer that uh, in this you know in one quick seconds, one quick second. Okay, so let's uh, try it again. Okay, so now on the general channel of Slack, you should have um, uh, the answer to the question that you see uh, on the uh, uh, on the slide. So the questions are. Uh, so what are the what is the question? Uh, question is uh, you have like a typical me medical research study um, in which null hypothesis of no effect of a drug is tested again the, the alternative H1 that there is some effect uh, and suppose the study uh, results pass a statistical test a significance of uh, p less than 0.05 in favor of H1. What has been shown? Uh, and so if you could take please all uh, one minute to um, uh, think. Uh, Quickly and see uh, what uh, what is uh, what is, I mean what has been shown is it one two three four five six or seven as the answers and uh, on that poll and we'll uh, and we'll uh, look at the results in a, in a second. So uh, we see that uh, some responses are coming and you know this is not an assignment this is like you know I mean we're we're not going to look at uh, uh, on those uh, those things. But I see that you know things are coming up. So there's already uh, maybe a bit uh, thirty people that have responded. So let's uh, wait for another ten or twenty uh, uh, in the in the class. Okay. All right, so there's already 30 participants in that poll. Uh, if, uh, if no more, I think we'll, we'll get it there. Uh, so, uh, I see that the number of votes uh, goes up and down, so people will change a bit their mind depending on their, I, I'm suppose, I suppose depending on what other people will answer. <laughs> but I think, I think it would be fair to say that um, uh, the biggest responses are three uh, and uh, six. Uh, so three edge zero is probably false uh, and six, uh, both three and four, which is uh, edge zero is probably false uh, and H1 is probably true. And I think that's, that's the general feeling that people have when they, they do a test, uh, a statistical test, they think, okay, if a test is significant, so that's probably that uh, H1 is probably true. And the problem is that uh, a statistical test doesn't give you anything on the hypothesis themselves. Uh, you know, they, they, they don't tell you anything uh, in principle, uh, they, they, they tell you in general, I mean, they, you know, like it's not like a, um, there's no information, but they, they don't answer the question of whether H1 or H0 uh, are uh, something on H1 or H0. They answer the question on the data. 
given some of the H1 of the zero. But if you want to have something on the H1 of zero, given the data, then you have to introduce a prior. You have to introduce something else in the Bayesian framework. So, so that's that's the problem. Um, and and you know it's very unclear for most people that you know this is not this is not something that is. Uh, and you're absolutely you know. Uh, and I'm actually would be interested to see whether you are about the same sort of a percentage that the medical students uh, we've who had some statistical uh, back. I mean, uh, uh, statistical learning, uh, statistical lessons. Uh, you know, do you you do better or not? I think I think it's a very general, uh, very general uh, problem that the, the statistics are not well taught, and actually many textbooks that it's it's absolutely unclear what is a test is about and what is what does a test answer. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll we'll discuss that a bit more, uh, uh, I guess, during the week. But uh, but I think it's important for you to understand that at least. You, uh, if you know, like, uh, it's not. Uh, it's not that you you're not a good student. It's just like you know, it's very badly taught, and it's uh, it takes a lot of effort to understand exactly what a test means, uh, uh, and it's something about the data. Uh, so that's uh, and 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 indeed for these uh, medical students, you had the same sort of thing. Like you know, the uh, um, so the uh, the number uh, mostly people were responding three and four uh, as well, uh, or six actually. Um, which is uh, both of them and um and seven which is the right answer not at all i mean none of those things can tell you something but uh, the uh, the hypothesis is is uh, is not uh, often chosen uh, because because tests are less are not very understood um one of the thing that uh, was uh, interesting uh, i mean uh, uh, one of the prominent thing that uh, uh, was happening in for the reproducibility crisis is this uh, estimation the, is is the replication of results uh, by uh, nosec et al and you see that the uh, so they it was very interesting uh, also community experience because they they ask uh, labs to uh, you know uh, they, they selected like a, a list of experiments and they ask lab in psychology so it's, it's kind, of, kind of like easier to do than uh, brain imaging because you don't have to uh, spend an enormous amount of money and time to actually scan people you just uh, give a, a, a test uh, you know like a behavioral or a, a, a test and then, and that's much easier to do but but still, it's uh, it's not that easy, and uh, and so they 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 replicated. They tried to replicate. Uh, I think about hundred uh, 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 results, and they looked at the effect size in particular, and you know how much you know, what, how much was the reaction time changing and those things, um, and and this this is the uh, uh, the plot where you you see that the. Um, the original effects versus uh, the the, uh, the the one that was the, in the replication, and you see a lot of the, those red uh, dots that have uh, not that has much smaller uh, effect and have not been uh, significant in the replication. Uh, uh, and the um, and importantly, like you look at the the uh, the, the replication power, which is the uh, the probability that you will find something if the uh, hypothesis, the, the alternative hypothesis is true, and that that replicating power is about uh, you know is 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 kind of a, a large for most of those things. So not all of them. But, uh, so you could discard maybe some of those um, uh, lit very little dots, but still in general you find some. Um, uh, much uh, smaller uh, effects in uh, in many of those uh, of those replications uh, replication. Um, uh, so this is one of my favorite uh, uh, time for Fiverr because it explains so much uh, in in terms of the problem. This is the uh, a set of uh, papers and, and results uh, on uh, the impact of uh, the BN BDNF allele on the hippocampal volume. Uh, so, if you look at the BNF allele and you look at, you know, as does the uh, that specific allele has a, an effect on the, or whether the the size of the hippocampus uh, on the size of the hippocampus, then you find like in in the 2000 like uh, years, uh, you have like a, a, a effect size fairly all over the place uh, and and very large effect size. So this is the Cohen's D effect size. Uh, which is the uh, the row effect size I would say divided by the standard division of the data, uh, in, and you look at and the and the size of the little uh, circles are the size of the cohort. So small cohorts are small circles, uh, and you see that the uh, the uh, in the early days there's a bit of an effect size everywhere, uh, and then as the uh, effect size the sorry the uh, uh, the the size of the cohort uh, grew. 
and you got you know larger cohorts in a, uh, in later years, uh, you see that these uh, cohorts were showing like much uh, smaller effect sizes. So what what is happening here is that uh, with small cohorts, uh, you can by sampling uh, just by problem by sampling problem, you can have large effect sizes. Uh, and those uh, large effect sizes are not um, standing when uh, when you increase the size of the cohort, and therefore, all the you know the, uh, uh, the the question of like making sure that we have enough data, and therefore uh, making sure that we can uh, share and access data uh, such that we can uh, do a better job. So that's a, that was a very uh, important um, study, and it's been replicated in some ways. Power issues have been uh, explained uh, quite well by the uh, uh, this uh, Button et al paper, that is a landmark paper, uh, showing that uh, uh, this um, in most of the neuroscience experiments, the power of experiments of those experiments, so the the, the probability that you 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 will find a result given that the H one is true, is is small, and that's um, and that has two effects. I mean, that has the effect that you you are uh, that has actually. Uh, um, yeah, the effect that you you are overestimating the effect size in the in the published result because when whenever you find something even with a small cohort you have a, you're more likely to actually uh, publish that that result uh, so so but, but that effect size that effect that you find is uh, is likely to be I mean it has a good it has some good chance to be overinflated be, just because. Uh, you have like sample uh, too few uh, uh, participants or, or, or animals or like, you, know, you have too, too, too few samples. And the, the other problem is that uh, if you have like a, a small, uh, small sample size, a small power, um, you also have an increased probability of, uh, uh, you decrease the probability of that you will find that result again. Uh, and that's called the uh, probability positive value. Uh, it has, uh, which is, is a concept that uh, I will explain maybe uh, a bit later, but basically the chance that you will find that result again are diminishing. Um, so uh, what the important aspect in that paper is that the most of the effect sizes, uh, most of the, uh, the, the, the power in the uh, neuroscience experiment are, are, quite, are quite small. Like uh, you see like that distribution of power that they, uh, they studied, they looked at all the papers and look at the, and uh, try to estimate and get the, the power of all those papers. And they, they see that, you know, like uh, there is uh, uh, more than, you know, like uh, I think something like uh, uh, the median is about 30% uh, power, which is very, very small. Uh, you know, like you wouldn't embark in a, in a clinical trial with a 30% power, power because you, it's a lot of research and, 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 and time and, and money spent uh, for very little chance to make, to find the result if there is a result. So, okay, so you, 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 you're not going to, uh, to embark in that with that small. But that's what is happening that, or, you know, or at least was happening uh, uh, in in your science experiments, in any neuroscience experiment. Um, more recently, there's a, a very nice paper by uh, Ross Podrak and others uh, showing that the uh, this is across the years again, um, looking at the uh, um, the uh, uh, the median uh, sample size of of neuroimaging studies. So in uh, 2010, the median sample size was about uh, 20 participants in a, in a study. Uh, and with like a lot of uh, a standard deviation, of course, uh, but that's the median. Uh, and in 2015, it was more like a 22, 23 or something. Uh, uh, and this is the, 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 uh, the, uh, the related uh, curve, the related graph that shows you what is the effect size that I have, um, I can detect with uh, with that number of uh, uh, with that number of participants in the study, and obviously you know the, the more participants and with the years we got more uh, participants, the uh, smaller the effects uh, I can uh, I can detect uh, with uh, eighty percent power with a good chance of of detecting that that uh, that effect, and uh, and you see that you know in two thousand fifteen so five years ago roughly uh, the uh, that effect uh, was about one. Uh, uh, and and that's and that is a large effect. And and to show that it is a large effect, uh, uh, they, show, they look at the uh, the median effect size in the uh, HCP uh, data set in the uh, Human Connectome Project data set, and they look at the, the median effect size in uh, for various uh, paradigm functional uh, 
functional uh, MRI paradigm, uh, so the motor, uh, working memory, emotion, gambling, and they look at the, the median effect size in the, uh, the most responding region. And, the, and that median effect size, even for motor, is, um, is, is 0.7, 0 0.6. Uh, and for like, things that are a bit less, uh, you know, uh, bit less uh, obvious, that you know, like a motor response should be very obvious, um, uh, then that's uh, 0.3, 0.5. So clearly demonstrating uh, that we don't have, you know, the power to detect things with the number of participants that uh, were, are usually taken in the neuroimaging experiment. And I think that should change the, the entire way, uh, you know, the field is considering uh, how we, uh, we analyze and what we do in terms of uh, data analysis. Because the, all those studies with uh, 25, 30 participants showing some uh, results, uh, it is unclear that we have the power to detect, uh, you know, even fairly strong uh, activities uh, like uh, motor primary cortexes, uh, but you know, certainly less, uh, even less for the uh, uh, for like a more subtle uh, aspect of the paradigms. So, if you think that machine learning is going to, uh, uh, you know, help you and say, oh, okay, but that's all classical and boring uh, statistics, uh, you know, let's, uh, uh, I'm now. That's so, right, we, we had a uh, question for the previous slide. Sure. Uh, which is, why, why do we see a decrease in the second graph when the sample sizes are increasing? Okay, because that's the uh, the effect size. So, the, uh, the, the amount of, uh, like, let's say the effect size is the, uh, 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 the difference of activity between uh, 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 between the activation period versus the rest period versus the control period. Okay, so that's the, that difference of activity. Okay, and so if you want to detect that difference of activity, uh, you have to uh, you detecting it across uh, parts across subject. You you have a graph of uh, you know that difference of activity okay, across subject, and the more subjects you have. The less variance you will have on the mean of that activity, right? I mean, like you, you, you have this little, you know, square root of n that is decreasing the variance of that, of that mean, uh, n being the number of participants. So, so, the more participants you have, the more uh, able you are to detect a small effect size, a small increase of activity. Is that, is that answering uh, uh, the question? Hopefully, if not, we'll go go back to it. Um, but that's a that's an important concept, you know. Like a, uh, we're looking, we're looking, we're you know, in when we're doing some statistical tests, we we are, we are using the variance of the of the effect, right, across participants. Uh, and so, uh, if if uh, the more participants we have, uh, the the more we are able to actually detect a, a small uh, a smaller effect uh, across all those participants. That's a very very important concept. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so, if you thought that uh, machine learning is uh, is the way out because you know we're not you're not doing statistical tests, you're just doing uh, sort of like a, a prediction, uh, but we are measuring uh, you know how well you're doing the prediction with accuracy. This is a very in, uh, important study from um, uh, Gael, who hopefully will give you a, a talk as well at the end of this week on a, on a more like a more advanced machine learning aspect. Um, where it took the, um, uh, you, you looked at the reported accuracy, so how, how well the prediction is done uh, across, uh, across many different uh, courts and, and papers, and with the number, uh, varying the number of, of uh, participants in the court. Uh, and you see that the accuracy itself, um, the reported accuracy, is actually going down with the number of participants, exactly like you know, if I go back to the to this slide, this is the same sort of slide. You know, you you're looking at instead of looking at the effect size and the uh, in and looking at the the effect size is getting smaller and smaller. You're looking at the accuracy, but this is the same sort of effect that you have uh, less and less accuracy with the uh, with a uh, with larger and larger cohort. Uh, this is a, a very important. Not everywhere, and that's a you know it's a bit of a mystery to me. What's uh, why uh, some courts are not behaving the same way? So I think that uh, would be an interesting uh, question to answer sometime. But in general, that seems to be clearly the case. Um, and I want to go back to uh, to this: uh, uh, why must published result findings are false? Uh, and the and the sort of like a, in the in this uh, 2005 paper by uh, uh, John Hanedis there. You know the, the the key aspect was uh, to look at uh, 
um, so you, you, there are like a, a measure of, 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 the, of how you likely you are to find that, uh, that, uh, uh, that alternative hypothesis. So the probability of the alternative hypothesis is knowing that the test is, is true. Uh, you know, and what is, what is that, uh, that the test is positive. Uh, and that's, that is not a very complex formula. It, uh, it has to do with the, uh, the power, uh, which is the power of the analysis. Uh, it has to do with the, uh, what is called the odd ratio. Uh, the, the odd ratio is the, it's sort of like the prior that you have, like is my like, uh, hypothesis, very, uh, null hypothesis very likely or unlikely? Is my alternative hypothesis unlikely or very likely? And you do a ratio of those likelihood of, you know, like the probability that those things are, you know, you know like, a, you know, if you have the probability that, uh, you know, like uh, cows can fly, you know, that's probably a very, not a very likely probability, uh, hypothesis. And, you know, if I want to test that, I probably would put uh, like a, a very low likelihood on that uh, probability. But maybe if I do find that uh, cows can fly, it's a very, it's a very surprising result. But, you know, like uh, maybe there's, uh, there's some experiment that's showing that, is going to show that so so it's a it's it's a prior on on those things uh, and then also as a function it's a function of uh, the risk of uh, false positive that you allow your test to have uh, and if you look at uh, those graphs you, know, you look at the this pro uh, this, this probability of uh, finding the alternative um, uh, uh, to be true uh, given the test uh, again and you f you find with um, as a, as a function of power you find that with low power you know, that probability to find uh, the, the, to, uh, the, the, the alternative is true, uh, given the, uh, the test is positive, that probability uh, that the alternative is true is, is kind of like a 0.5. And that's with a, a standard, like a risk of error, of a type one error of 0.5%. So like you're allowing uh, not uh, too, too much. Of it. But we know that for many reasons, uh, and uh, and I will, uh, you know, and that what we call p hacking is one of the uh, the, the problem. Our, our you know uh, risk of error is probably less than 0.05. It's uh, actually I mean greater than 0.05 in, in this in this respect. And so like if you look at you know power of uh, 0.3, which is the uh, was the uh, median power for the Bettonetal paper, then the probability of finding that uh, that. Uh, uh, hypothesis is true is, is actually uh, maybe of the order of 0.2, like a, a one over five. So it's a, it's a, it is a real statistical problem uh, that, you know, like if power is not uh, good enough and the, if a number of uh, participants is not good enough for having like good power, uh, and if you have, if we have like a, a biased um, or like a, a not correct uh, uh, type one error, then we, we we are likely to get like a unreproducible results. And that's the kind of like a theoretical demonstration of it um, by your analytics. Uh, I will, I don't think uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm seeing my time. I'm running really out of time. I've, I've taken a, uh, so I will go a little bit over because, uh, but uh, I will go, I will skip that slide. Uh, I have put uh, the slides. I will put also the notes on the slides uh, in the PDF. So just we have a, uh, so let's go to the, so that was uh, my first part on the statistical aspect, uh, which uh, I think is, is, is one of the, yeah, that is uh, the most important, but there are a lot of issues in the data and software as well. Uh, so uh, I, like, I like that example. I have, uh, have to tell you this little story because uh, it's in such a, a lovely example. Um, it's, uh, it, this is an example of researcher, it's a good researcher, that uh, uh, published in very high profile journals, um, that used uh, a homemade data analysis program uh, that uh, unfortunately had one quick small little error. It actually had a minus sign somewhere that it shouldn't have. And, and it's a complex program, it's, uh, you know, uh, and the, it flipped the, uh, the structure of the protein that, uh, you know, this is a program to analyze the structure of the protein and the structure was flipped. Um, uh, and the uh, and you know that program was inherited by from another lab, another a good lab, um, and uh, and that program was given given to other labs for like a collaboration or like a, for uh, helping out uh, people, and um, and that uh, and all those uh, you know nice papers had to be retracted, retracted because they would be uh, just like a, a very small little bug in uh, in one of the um, the, the software that was used. Um, this is the Petit et al. Uh, uh, story that you, uh, uh, you know, like it, it's, it's such an interesting story. Uh, it's, it, uh, it, it started with a mistake. 
uh, I think I think it would be fair. Like my my, uh, my understanding of the story is that he started with a simple, very simple mistake. And I'll tell you the mistake. The mistake. So those researchers were looking at the cell lines and the um, and whether those cell lines were resistant to drugs, depending on the gene expression profile of uh, of participants. And the uh, and the mistake was that apparently uh, one of the program needed uh, two uh, CSV or Excel spreadsheet file as arguments. So you launch like an analysis for something, uh, Excel spreadsheet one and Excel Excel spreadsheet two. And uh, one of the the first uh, the first uh, Excel spreadsheet was uh, didn't uh, required I mean re uh, required not to have um, the headers like uh, so the the name of the columns were, should not be there. And the second in the second argument, you needed to have the uh, one column. So one column was uh, one one row. Sorry, one column one row was was actually expected to be the uh, the name of the of the uh, of the columns. And the first row, and and obviously it's a it's a this, you know it's a catastrophic design in terms of like uh, you know but those are research programs. People don't like uh, you know like uh, uh, they don't care too much about those things because they are just research programs. And um, uh, and obviously the mistake was that uh, therefore uh, there was a shift by one one row. Uh, uh, you know like uh, the the two I mean the arguments were. Uh, both had the maybe the uh, the, uh, the the column names, and therefore uh, the first argument was not uh, as expected, and was a shift by one row, and so it shifted the uh, uh, the um, uh, the gene names with like uh, with whatever information that should have been there, and therefore all the uh, the analysis was was actually uh, uh, erroneous. And that went very far because then they tried to cover up, and then they uh, and they went to up to uh, like uh, doing a clinical trial with that with uh, those uh, bad res with those erroneous results and all those things. But you know, I think that's not. I mean, the whole story is, is like it's called the uh, the Duke scandal. Like, uh, the, but that's not the point I want to make. The point I want to make is that the whole thing started with a simple mistake and that and when two biostatisticians start to uncover and, and try to say hey what what is this method about and how did that work and uh, they it took a long time for them to discuss you know to you know uncover you know what how how did they do how the authors did their work which is one uh, of the lesson uh, you know it, uh, it took such a long time for two good biostatisticians to look at uh, what's going on uh, and the second thing that they they, they conclude that the, uh, the most common errors are simply are simple and the most simple errors are, are kind of common. Uh, so we have to kind of like think of how we protect ourselves, how we make sure uh, we uh, we do be a better job. And so uh, please read the uh, Bagley and Combs uh, forensic paper. Uh, it's it's a very interesting one. Uh, across US, uh, uh, it's interesting to see the variation of results that we can get uh, depending on OS. I, I, I won't go through that uh, because of time, but uh, uh, please read the uh, or have a look at the uh, Glatter, Tristan Glatter, uh, who is a, a good colleague of us uh, in Concordia in, uh, in uh, neuroinformatics, so like uh, looking at the variation when you're uh, launching the same program uh, on different uh, operating systems. Uh, and uh, you know, same uh, same free software, different property system, and looking at the difference between the uh, uh, the, the mean absolute difference that you see on, in the, on the uh, gray matter thickness, for instance, is one of the you know interesting uh, you know, yeah, results. I mean, you, you wouldn't expect that. And there are good reasons why that happens, uh, but you wouldn't expect that. Uh, Cross-platform implementation. I will skip. To, this is a little uh, a study that we did a couple of years ago with some uh, my uh, uh, pastor colleague in uh, in uh, in Paris. Uh, but I, I will skip that uh, just to show that uh, uh, the code, uh, get, uh, even giving the code and the data, is probably not enough often to uh, be able to replicate easily uh, results. Uh, this is uh, an interesting uh, sort of the same sort of problem, but it's a, a slide by Joel Pino. Same sort of problem in machine learning. Uh, so those are two uh, algorithms, uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, that uh, and two implementations, and they and they behave uh, very differently across implementations. And I think that's uh, again that's a, that's just a fact, an interesting fact that you know depending on the implementation of the same algorithms, uh, you 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 do find very different results in the in this uh, in the machine learning as well. Across parameterization of the same software and across software. Uh, okay, this is a, a 
an interesting study that should look at the, what's the uh, uh, what's the false positive detection rate, what's the uh, uh, of um, uh, a test on the size of clusters in brain imaging in a, in functional MRI. So if you look at the the size of the cluster, of those clusters, if you cut the, you cut your activation map, you look at uh, what's uh, above a, a threshold, and you look at the size of those objects, uh, those uh, regions, and if those regions are too large, there are tests to show you that you know they are unlikely, and therefore you can do statistical test on whether they're, they're too unlikely to be uh, just nuts. And this um, and uh, and it happens to be that if that threshold is too low, that uh, those uh, the, the false detection rate the the, the false positive um, uh, is, uh, uh, rate is very high. The type one error is very high. So, uh, so the uh, the false yeah the false detection rate is very high, and that's what they show. They show like a false detection rate of very very high. Um, and if you, the threshold is uh, lower, then 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 the, the things are much better. So it's basically parametrization. I mean, the way I interpret that is that mostly the problem was coming from a bad parametrization of uh, of the test. Across software, uh, I won't I won't uh, go, but that this is the uh, size of the thickness of the cortical thickness uh, measured by different two different software uh, ants here and the uh, free software, and you see like a very very tall correlation, which is uh, uh, frightening, and uh, and this is like the correlation between uh, free software version 5.1, free software 5.3, which is. Uh, at least a bit uh, better. That could be interpreted as improvement of the software, but uh, not uh, radically different uh, results. Uh, same sort of things have been found in uh, functional MRI. This is this was like on the cortical thickness aspect. Uh, um, this is the uh, same data set being analyzed by uh, AFNI, SPM, and FSL for those working in functional imaging, uh, neuroimaging, and uh, and showing the difference between those. Uh, uh, free, free software and uh, looking at you know how uh, uh, across all those voxels what are what are the uh, uh, the t values found um, uh, across those voxels and we see that there are, there are vast differences uh, in those in those things so this is uh, looking at the uh, uh, the differences on the uh, uh, on this size versus the uh, uh, sorry uh, um, yeah, the average uh, t statistic on the x-axis and the differences of uh, the t statistic across those software um, on the y-axis. And you see a lot of differences. <laughs> uh, some of the results are not going to be the same depending on what software you're looking at. So that's uh, just like a, this is a uh, two wall paper in 2016 is showing this in one specific context. Uh, uh, and also cross pipelines. Uh, there's this famous uh, landmark paper by CARP uh, showing that uh, you know depending on if you take some parameterization of a pipeline, functional MRI uh, detection pipeline, uh, you are able to uh, so you take all the parameterization possible parameterization, you plot what is the maximum t value found uh, on the uh, on the uh, the uh, in, on the surface of the brain, and you find that that t value maximum t value can be in many many different places. Um, and all those parameterization were uh, correct in some ways because they were all taken from the current uh, you know what is being reported as uh, you know like a standard parameterization uh, in the literature. Uh, I will skip that. Uh, there's a lot of course in bulk in data as well. So I think uh, just one one word of caution and one word of like a, uh, I'm uh, old enough that you know like I lived in the time where we had uh, before Nifty we had the uh, analyze format where we had, there was a dot .emg and a dot .hdr for those uh, for the data and we never knew what was right, what the left of the side of the brain when was, was the right side of the brain. And still today, this like uh, knowing this and uh, and making sure that this is right is uh, is I think mostly solved. But you know, for a long time, you'll see many results and many papers where you would have no idea whether there was a shift in the uh, left and right uh, of the brain because of the radiological versus neurological conventions and uh, and people always i mean not always get it right uh, so that's one possible uh, wrongness in the data there's a lot of possible uh, uh, wrongness as well so the, the wrong qc the uh, test retest is not good uh, uh, the headers are not correct the uh, uh, the uh, even in the csv the uh, the, the the colon that is named uh, uh, sam is not uh, is not uh, is not clear what it is and <laughs> and so on um, uh, oh and, and there's a very nice little uh, 
YouTube video uh, for you, like if you want to uh, uh, take a break, so, you know, like at, at some stage, uh, please have a look at that uh, uh, little video. It lasts for three, four minutes. It explains a lot of the problem of like uh, documenting the data uh, properly is, is really important. The last thing I want to uh, touch upon uh, is uh, the cultural issue and the publication practice of uh, and the search incentive and how we can possibly change that. So this is going to be more like a uh, sort of like a vision of, of things that we want to change for the future. Um, and I think one of the key uh, problems uh, in is that you know, we are pushed by our uh, ecosystem to uh, uh, publish rapidly and, and publish often. Um, and that's uh, that's you know that's not bad in itself. It's just like a, um, then there's a sort of like a balance between uh, how much a check and how much uh, are you going to take another uh, 50 subjects uh, to make sure that you do find the results, or are you going to publish that uh, paper quicker and, uh, and and start with the what you have? And so there's a there's kind of like a, this uh, this balance that is uh, seems to be. Uh, a little bit biased uh, towards uh, uh, quicker and, and not uh, solid enough results in in, uh, in many instances. Uh, and again, it's not uh, to blame anyone or anything, um, you know, on the system. It's just like, a, seems to be just purely, I'm describing it just as a fact. Um, uh, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not to, uh, to blame uh, anything. Uh, Dorothy Bishop explains also like this, uh, this with this uh, graph where she says, okay, uh, uh, you need to generate a hypothesis, but you have like a, a difficulties in controlling the, the bias and the study design. Uh, so therefore, when once the data are collected, they're going to be analyzed in many, many different ways. And because they are analyzed in many, many different ways, uh, you increase the, the the probability of finding something significant <laughs> uh, because you know you are you know, is that because that's the right way of analysis or is just because you've tried many many things and that's the uh, like a controlling for those things is uh, so that's the what uh, we call the p hacking problem uh, and then uh, if you don't find anything significant uh, we had hit another problem which is called the file draw effect problem where you would actually not publish that result. And that still will be a useful result for uh, others to have, especially in meta-analysis. So, uh, so changing you know, the incentive of what we publish and how we publish is uh, one of the things uh, that is uh, important. So let's say you do some peer hacking, you find some um, results. So you'll, it's not the result you entirely expected. So you are going to be some what is called harking, which is the hypothesis after reading the results, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then go on with the, uh, the next uh, experiment and so on. So I think it's a bit of a, you know, like again, bleak um, way of seeing things. Uh, I think it's just an, it's an exaggeration. It's not, it's not the whole thing being described, but there's a danger of going that way that we should uh, uh, care about. So proposals, what we can do, we can improve the training that we, we hope that's, you know, this week and, uh, and, uh, and uh, for the whole Brent High School, this is uh, like one thing that uh, will uh, improve. Uh, we can try to put more emphasis in, uh, in, uh, in doing the better tools and make sure that, you know, people developing tools analysis have a better uh, toolbox with them. And that's really the goal of uh, that, uh, the, the, those weeks and this, uh, in these first weeks in particular, uh, that you learn those basic tools uh, and also maybe try to find ways of uh, changing our uh, community incentives uh, across uh, and, and uh, for that. So that's uh, data science. For that, there are many uh, initiatives. Uh, Reproning, which is one of the uh, projects that is uh, reproducibility in your imaging, uh, is developing tools and, uh, and, uh, and training components for that. Um, so these are all the things. Um, also, like uh, finding ways of publishing things that are different than just the uh, sort of biological results, uh, just uh, having like a to squeeze the methods in a little section, uh, not making sure that we publish uh, a research objects that are uh, things like such like data sets is, a, is something that takes a long time to query and to curate and to check and to quality check and so on. And those things should be uh, 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 really like a research object that should, should lead to a lot of recognition and when they're um, given to the, okay, the research object that community should be able to access, we use. Um, and those, uh, and there are now journals specializing, for instance, in publishing those kind of research objects. I think that's a, that's a very that's an excellent way, and that has already changed quite a lot of uh, how we uh, we do things. Uh, there are 
labs that a, a few years ago would never thought of uh, of not an, uh, acquiring data, and now those labs are thinking, okay, uh, I don't need to acquire data. I'm just going to uh, you know like uh, take all those data out there, which means that we have to be even more careful in documenting and checking those data. Uh, and uh, this is like a, yeah, uh, this is building functional tools. This is like a referring to the putty et al problem. This is a slide from uh, Rust uh, you know, like uh, showing like the, uh, that we have to build tools that are, uh, you know, that have some kind of safe uh, security a little bit in, 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 in uh, embedded. Uh, this is a, a, a shredder. And the only way you can actually use that shredder is that because you have like the, those two green button and those two green button, you, you need to actually put your two hands in those two buttons such that you won't be able to actually put your hand in the shredder. <laughs> so that's a safety measure. Uh, and in, uh, in, the, in the world of like uh, industry, this is well known in research software, this is way less known. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, and, and exemplified again by the, uh, 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 by the Begley uh, uh, study. Um, uh, that's uh, you know. So think of a uh, you know. Uh, are, what are the likely mistakes that I'm going to make with that uh, with, with that piece of uh, analysis of that software? And, like, uh, and it's uh, like a, it's a mindset really that uh, that needs to be uh, changed. Um, um, and I think uh, so. This is my graph on you know making sure that uh, we are. Uh, uh, working in a in a uh, open in collaborative in a and and producing uh, fair and I want to uh, just say what is fair fair is uh, findable accessible interoperable and reusable research objects so research objects like uh, uh, analysis uh, software uh, data sets uh, uh, combination of those uh, I think uh, that uh, you know if we if we make those things. Uh, more uh, fair, uh, and that's such a great acronym, um, uh, we, we are going to do a lot of good uh, for our communities. Uh, and a lot of the uh, aspect is really to how do we, uh, uh, we increase the, uh, the way we, improve the way we publish things. And for instance, if I take that, uh, uh, that quote from, uh, so this is a, a slide from Dave Kennedy, um, increase in resting state connectivity between right superior temporal gyrus and right superior um, frontal gyrus in subject with autism and this connectivity correlates with diagnostic severity. So that's a conclusion of a paper, like it's a kind of fake paper, but um, there's so much uh, that is, you know, uh, what is exactly this increase? Uh, what is uh, how those things were, uh, uh, as the resting state connectivity uh, on what data and what analysis and what uh, software parameter those are those results generalizing with um, uh, uh, with the uh, with the with changes in the the way we uh, estimate that uh, resting state connectivity? Uh, what is exactly how was defined those uh, uh, anatomical regions and and all those things? So like uh, so uh, attaching to like uh, providing not a paper with like, a PDF but uh, providing all those details such that people can see how far um, generalizes, uh, how far those results uh, can generalize and, and, uh, and what exactly has been shown is, is, uh, is one of the things we want to uh, see happening more in the future. Um, I will skip all those things, uh, give a couple of thank you for like uh, many colleagues and uh, thank you uh, uh, for all for uh, listening to that and uh, we'll take a, uh, a couple of questions before we move to the uh, next uh, step, <laughs> the stage of the, um, of the day. And I cannot hear the questions so we'll uh, Stop share my slides. I see a lot of um, questions on, on Slack. I will. I think the questions on Slack are not related to the lecture. All of the questions for the lecture have been posted in the, the group. Sorry, no, no, sorry, I, I said Slack, but I meant uh, uh, chat. <laughs> yeah, and they've, they've largely been answered, yes. Okay. Uh, all right. So, okay. What QC stands for? Quality control. Uh, thank you. Uh, nice uh, meta analysis. Uh, on. Okay. Yes. You any all questions are good. Please. Um, okay. Uh, so. 
there is any other so, question? So we do have some new ones at the at the bottom. Uh, from Ed, Edouard, you talked about effect size, how to determine what is the correct group size that should have they should have for our analysis. Right, that's a good question. Very good question. Uh, so, um, so the it's it's all uh, all those power analysis uh, uh, business is is a bit tricky because uh, what you're doing is you're thinking, okay, what is the most risible effect size that I will find. So for instance, you're doing an fMRI data, you're doing an fMRI study, and you're thinking, okay, um, uh, I expect the difference between my condition one and condition two to increase the bolt signal by 2%. Uh, and you have to know that in advance to say, okay, if I have, um, if I know that's the increase by 2%, if I have a, a reasonable idea of what kind of noise I have on this, then I can choose the number of participants such that I will have a good chance of uh, detecting those two two percent increase, this two percent increase. So the way you choose those two percent is you look at the literature uh, and you look at uh, reasonably uh, similar uh, studies, and you say, okay, uh, those uh, authors in that study they found uh, an increase of like um, uh, 1.5 percent, and those ones uh, 2.5 percent, and these ones like uh, you know. And I I I think that my study is going to be around those numbers, and that's uh, you know. And then you can be more or less uh, uh, you know like a, you know, but that, but you never know in advance. If that study is actually a true new study, um, you know it's um, it's it's you may be surprised by it, and you don't really know. You just have to, you know, like uh, uh, you just have to uh, predict a little bit uh, what you think will be a, a visible number, uh, which is not uh, not always easy uh, in, in all circumstances. So, so that's a that's a problem, and and obviously, uh, if you if you find like a, something significant. <clears throat> You know, you still can be on the sort of like uh, uh, you can still be it can still be significant by sampling issues. It can be that you, by chance or or, or, or you know, lack of chance or lack of luck, uh, you have sampled uh, thirty participants or thirty-five participants that have you know like uh, had a bit uh, more signal in that. While you know this is you're still looking at some uh, some noise or you like uh, you're still in there. So there's no uh, there's no um, uh, way of uh, making of knowing for sure, uh, and there's no this is just why this is just a probability, and this is why not reporting just the p-value, but reporting everything, reporting the confidence interval, reporting the uh, uh, the, uh, um, the 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 actual value for the uh, uh, variance of the of the of the data, the actual value for the mean of the data, all those things uh, is important. It's just not. I mean, the, the p-value is just uh, um, too, um, uh, uh, I would say, too uh, grabbing too many things together, and 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 you know, it doesn't give you the full information. Uh, that's that's one problem. But uh, for the for the uh, going back to the uh, power analysis, yes, you do need uh, to have like some prior ideas, uh, and yeah, yeah. It's, it's not always easy. Yeah. If you do a model comparison with and without QC data, how do you know if a model performed better before if it was better because the QC data is uh, in smaller size? That's a very good question as well. Uh, so, um, <laughs> so I would say, so let's say, let's say you, you what the, okay, uh, let, me, let me just say the thing that should not be done. It's basically, uh, I have a bunch of data I'm looking and some of those data look a bit off. They have like a little bit extreme values, okay. Uh, those, these participants have like a, you know, like a, an extreme value in some way. And I'm, and I'm saying, okay, because it, this participant has an extreme value, I, you know, like a, I, I, my, I, I designed a QC, a created check that says, hey, those extreme values are too high or too low. Uh, they can't be true. And therefore I'm removing the data. Uh, and then I do, uh, and then if you do that, we like depending on the threshold that you're going to choose, you're going to homogenize and 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 uh, decrease the variance of your data, and therefore uh, uh, have a, like a, a better chance of detecting something. 
And the problem with that is that you don't know whether that uh, extreme value is just like taken from the actual distribution or just uh, spurious from some reason. So if you have a cause that you can say, hey, I measure the movement, the movement of that uh, participant and the movement was like uh, this, this, uh, this participant moved by two centimeters uh, like during the, uh, the, the scanning session. That is a cause that you say that is independent on the value of the activation, like, you know, whatever value of the activation that, you know, the movement uh, is the movement. And that is where, that's how you do the QC. And that's, uh, you know, like a quality check is, uh, should not be on the, uh, done on, obviously, on the, on the values of data. And then there's the, also the business, of course, of uh, making sure that you have like a robust uh, methods in terms of like uh, of, uh, statistics to analyze values that are not uh, necessarily uh, uh, normally distributed. And uh, we can talk a bit on that a bit more uh, on the uh, uh, Wednesday session, I think. Uh, Wednesday, of, yeah, Thursday or Wednesday, I can't remember. But we'll, have a, we'll have a session where we can discuss that a bit more in detail. Uh, during the poll, you explained that your test can't tell the probability of H1 at zero being true, but in the later slide, you saw ratio of the probability of your hypothesis being true. Explain what it means. Okay, so those are, when in the slides, when I, I looked at the ratio of those probability, the, those are, uh, so, um, okay, uh, those were prior probability. So it is the thing, this is in, in the way of thinking of probability of like, a, you know, like, a, you know, how likely is that thing, you know, it, which is uh, one way of thinking of probabilities. Um, uh, what is, is, is that hypothesis very likely and this uh, is the alternative uh, uh, or the null very likely. And this is the ratio of those things. This is prior. This is not related to the test at all. What I was saying is that the test itself is not telling you something on the on the hypothesis. It's telling you something on the data given one habit, one specific hypothesis that is H0. Uh, so that's uh, that's that's the distinction. I mean the the uh, uh, positive predictive value uh, uh, formula is uh, has to have uh, this odd ratio plugged in uh, but uh, but uh, this is the prior properties of the hypothesis not uh, the uh, and and you know and that's that's not something that is given by the test or anything. It's just a prior. It's something that you 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 think uh, is 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 uh, is is correct. Is is the most likely. Uh, 